Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 3rd of February and a few really cool updates this week. As always, I have the chapters so you can jump to any particular update you care about the most. For new videos this week, I took a little detour. I'm still updating the Azure Masterclass to the V2, but I did a dive into how encryption works. When you're viewing this video, what are the different types of encryption? How is it negotiated? How are secrets shared over the internet? I go into all of that in that video. And then I talked about XOR a whole bunch of times in the encryption video. So I thought I'd better go back and explain, just for those who maybe have not seen it, what does XOR really mean? So onto the new updates for Compute, AKS now has in GA, the free and standard tiers. Now this relates to the control plane. With Azure Kubernetes Service, the control plane, that's things like the API server, the etcd stateful database, the scheduler, the various controllers, they're all managed. And it's those things that this free and standard applies to. So with free, it's free, but there's no SLA to that control plane. Whereas with standard, I get an SLA for the control plane. Additionally, on that control plane, it supports up to 5,000 nodes. It auto scales that API server based on the workload. And so it'll also use availability zones where it can to distribute to make it more resilient. If I'm a production workload using AKS, I probably wanna use the standard tier, but obviously that does imply it's not free. There is a certain cost you pay for that. It does not affect the actual functionality of Kubernetes itself. Your node pools work exactly as they did before. Then for Azure Functions, there's now Node.js 18 support just in GA. So that's now an option that I can leverage in my applications. And then Durable Functions has some new storage backends. If I think about normal functions, they're serverless. They're event-driven, something happens, it does its job and it goes away. With a durable function, it's more long-lived and there's some stateful element to it. There's various patterns, like maybe I fan out to do various jobs and then I come back in and aggregate the results from those. It could be I need some manual human interaction as part of that flow. I might be chaining multiple functions together. I might have a function that's watching something else. All those patterns, it's a longer-lived function and it has some state that has to be maintained. So with Azure Functions, there's various storage providers that I can leverage. Azure Storage is still there. That's really the original storage provider. It's very simple to use, it's very cheap to use. What they've also added is two new ones. I can use SQL Server. Obviously the benefit of SQL Server, it's available anywhere. I have great fidelity and control over that service. But also it supports Neverite. So Neverite is from Microsoft Research. It's a combination of event hubs and page blobs, and it gives this phenomenally high throughput. So now we have these three options. I can still use Azure Storage, super simple. I can use SQL Server, hey, it's available anywhere, I have great control. And I have this Netherite, which is just phenomenally high throughputs. So I can use all of those with my durable functions. On the storage side, I can now copy append, I can only add things to the end of the blob, and page blobs, great for random access, to block blob, and then leverage tiering. So with block blob, I have tiers. I have the hop, the core, and the archive. And the archive is very attractive because it's super cheap, but it's not available in real time. I have to bring it out of archive back into a call or hop tier. But archive is not available for my append and page blobs. So what I can now do is I can copy my append or page blob to a block blob into archive, for example, to take advantage of that much cheaper long-term storage. And if I need to use it again, I can copy the other way. So as part of my copy of a block blob, I can use a destination blob type parameter to say, hey, I need to copy it into a page blob or copy it into an append blob. So I can go back the other way as well. So this is a really nice option. If I just need to, hey, I need to keep the page blob, need to keep the append blob as cheap as possible, I could now copy it to a block blob and store it in archive. On the miscellaneous, so Chaos Studio has a number of updates. 
Remember, Chaos Studio is there to help me fake or emulate certain types of failure. This could be failure to a node. It could be failure to an entire availability zone. It could be, hey, I'm gonna spike the CPU. I'm going to do various types of experiments and see what happens to my architecture that I've deployed. Well, it now has service tags. So service tags can now be leveraged as part of my network security groups to control the inbound and outbound flow from the service. I can now inject into a virtual network. So it can now interact with resources that don't have a public endpoint. So I've got some resource like a storage account that's using a private endpoint in a virtual network. Well now Chaos Studio can also inject into the VNet to interact with that private endpoint. It has target dynamic resources um, for things like virtual machine scale sets. So what that means is I could now have a filter as part of my targeting that only targets particular availability zones. So hey, I just wanna target all of the VMs in this VM scale set that's in AZ2. And I can also emulate certain types of key vault failure. So hey, the certificate is disabled, maybe there's a new version, um, I'm denied access. So different types of things I can add to my experiments to emulate different types of failure. Azure AD Cross Tenant Sync. So this is all about the idea that we're used to B2B. I can add a guest into my Azure AD. So if we think that, hey, I've got two Azure AD tenants, and I wanna be super clear, this scenario we're talking about is we have two tenants, but they're part of the same organization. There's been some acquiring of another company, so now I want tighter integration. This is not geared towards some external company. And the idea is, well, so this tenant has some resource or some service that I want users in this to just be able to seamlessly use. So there's some maybe SaaS application or something else. So what we can do with the cross-tenant access, um, sorry, the synchronization, is there's a flag I have to set on both the tenants, and I'll do a deeper dive video this week to go through the actual setup and demo it. But what I can configure is basically a push configuration to say if a user is in these particular groups, for example, I want to push them into this tenant. I can also do things like various mappings so I can convert certain attributes of the user, and then they will appear as external identities. I can set, is it a member or a guest? Because it's the same company, I may not want it to be a guest, I may want it to be of type member, and I can absolutely do that. So super quickly, if I show you this, I, I set this up. But again, I'll do the deeper dive video, don't worry, um, this week. But this is my source organization. So this source organization, in this case, is on board to Azure. And what I've done in this onboard to Azure is I've gone ahead and done provisioning. I'm setting up my cross-tenant access and I've tested the connection. I just checked for those flags there. And all I wanna really focus on right now is you have various types of mapping. And I did do an expression. So rather than just mapping the attributes directly, what I actually have here is for the display name, I changed it to expression and I'm appending their regular display name with onboard to Azure. So when it shows up in my other tenant, when I go and look at, for example, I could add these to the gal, well, this is what it did. You can see it synchronized it over, but it changed their display name to John Savile dash onboard to Azure. So I can easily tell, hey, this is from the other organization. And it's just gonna do this dynamically. So it's a, a really nice capability that now, as users get added to that organization, based on, I can set scopes, so I could do filters based on maybe attributes or just group memberships so or a combination of both, it will automatically add those as guests to the other tenant and I don't have to do any acceptance. I'm gonna bypass all of those consent prompts and everything else. They'll just show up as guests on a certain cycle. So this might solve a lot of challenges where I have those multiple organizations and I want a more seamless interaction between them. So that's the Azure AD cross-tenant sync now in preview. And again, 
I'll do a deeper dive video this week, probably post it Thursday. Azure Virtual Desktop watermarking. There are many features in Azure Virtual Desktop. It's this phenomenal solution, but it has things to stop you, for example, taking screenshots. So there's screen capture protection that will stop native screenshots, native sharing, but it doesn't stop me if I've got my screen up and I've got my phone and I take a picture of the screen. So what the watermarking will do is it will add a QR code all over the screen. I can configure that QR code. I can configure how big it's going to be. I can scale this and it will now show all over that desktop. So if someone does take a picture of it, well, when I see that picture, I'll be able to take that QR code and it will be able to be linked back to the particular desktop it came from. So I'll be able to see, oh, this person, it was this connection ID, that's who shared their screen and took the picture. So it will give me the ability to track it back. So it can't stop it. There's really limited things I can do to stop a human taking a picture of a display, but at least I'll be able to track back who did it. So that's in preview. And then Azure load testing has gone GA. So this is this managed service that lets me run those Apache JMeter scripts. It's designed to stress test my service. I can create the JMeter script, or if it's just a URL, just from the portal, I can say, hey, I wanna do a quick test, this is the URL, it will go and create that JMeter script for me. I can use regular plugins from the JMeter plugin site. I can upload my own plugin. I specify how many virtual users I want to have emulating and stressing against the site, and I pay for the amount of load that is required to actually do that testing. And what's really nice about this, it's funny, Chaos Studio and Azure Load Testing, both of these things would be really nice to put into a DevOps pipeline. So if I think about my CI, CD, I build my code, I deploy it to maybe a testing environment, well then the first thing I could do is run a load test against it. I can set failure criteria. I can have multiple failure criteria based on thresholds, based on number of requests, based on number of errors. Well, if any of those failed, I fail that stage and I, I go back to the beginning. But I could also build in Chaos Studio to make things fail as part of the testing to say, well, how resilient am I? So both of those features can work really nicely together as part of my all up automated pipeline uh, when I'm delivering my code. So that's now GA. And that was it. As always, I hope this was useful and I'll see you on the next video.